extended since 1882. And uh, the year was 1882, as I told you, 24th March. And Robert Koch presented his findings on tuberculosis to the Berlin Physiological Society. He wasn't a dynamic speaker. He was nervous and he was stammering. But what he told the world that day in the terms of his severest critic was pure, unadulterated gold. And it seems almost incredible that during the last two centuries, this disease has been responsible for the death of a billion human beings. And if you look at the milestones in TB from Robert Koch's discovery to 1944 when Selman Wax and and De, uh, De, uh, Robert Demarc actually described treatment for this disease. And you look at the tests that were described then, some of these tests are still in use today. Sputum microscopy, culture, and chest x-rays. From 1882, we still continue to use them. So clearly, suboptimal and delayed diagnosis has fueled the global TB epidemic. And I really like this slide because it puts into perspective that lack of proper support for TB really has not been a matter of affordability. It's hugely been an underestimation of its importance. And so whereas the developed world would, from symptoms, go on to molecular tests, in the, growing, in, in the countries that are developing, we have been stuck on X-ray smear and just histopathology for a long, long time. Things have changed, and things really have improved, and there's really been a growing shift. So there has been a new era ushered in, and the WHO has been particularly proactive in telling us what has to be done and what has not to be done. And I think that is really important because today we really have f much more clarity on TB than we did five years ago. So clearly we all know what should not be done. TB serology is inconsistent and imprecise, and it has been banned by the government of India. Similarly, what should not be done for active tuberculosis? Please remember that the IGRA tests are great to pick up latent tuberculosis. They're good in certain niche areas. They're good in, in, in patients who are on, on really immune suppressive therapy to say whether the patient is latently infected, but really not very good. In fact, there's another negative recommendation by the WHO that the IGRA tests are not really good for active tuberculosis. Strengthening TB labs from the unimaginable to the indispensable. And so today, what are the tests that should be done? With smear microscopy, you can actually see the bugs. With culture and DST, you can grow the bugs. And with the molecular tests, you can multiply the bugs. And this chart puts into perspective the di diagnostic sensitivity of smear microscopy. As you can see, it's really poor in sensitivity. Just 20% of children, 40% of HIV positive, and 70% in others can be picked up by this. So in 2009, the WHO actually endorsed LED-based fluorescent microscopy, which has a 10% better recovery. And we actually also analyzed this and helped the WHO actually in the STAG committee look at the LED-based fluorescence. And we did find there was a huge enhancement, 10%, compared to smear microscopy. And today we know that three, we've come down from three smears to two smears to even one smear. But that's one smear should be a morning sample if you had good EQA in place. So the policies by the WHO, I'm incidentally in, you know, sort of restricting my talk today. I can go on and on and a million methods to diagnose TB, but I'm only focusing on the WHO endorsed technologies today. Conventional fluorescent microscopy should be replaced by LED, and LED should be phased in as an alternative to ZL. We've all seen this. We've been brought up on culture because it is the gold standard. But somehow, that was responsible for giving TB a bad name and hanging him, as we say. Solid culture just took too long, and clinicians totally lost interest in the lab with this LJ. So improving sensitivity of culture and reducing the turnaround times has been a priority. In 2007, the WHO actually endorsed liquid culture with rapid ICT. And if you look at liquid culture, 40% sensitivity in kids, 80% in HIV positive, and 90% in others. So liquid culture is accurate, but let's face it, it's poorly accessible in India. We've actually did a study of almost 15,000 samples and published this some years back, where we showed that clearly in pulmonary tuberculosis, 8.7 was our turnaround days was our turnaround time with midget versus 33 days in LJ. For extra pulmonary tuberculosis, it was 13 days versus 37 days on LJ. 
What was more important, we found, was that the midget had an 18% better recovery than LJ. And that's big time. Also, if you had three plus positive samples, your turnaround time was less than seven days. We have clinicians actually calling us and saying, how can you give results in four days? And we say, just look at the smear. If the smear is four plus positive, you can actually get a readout on midget in four to five days. For smear negative, of course, the midget would take much longer. So there are advantages of midget, which are clearly they handle much more. We have eight or nine midgets at Hinduja. There's no radioactivity, and the turnaround time is much faster. But let me tell you, having worked with midget for the last 10 odd years, they, have, they are limitations. The limitations are that you need continuous electric supply, reagent costs are expensive, they are contamination rates, and IDs are required. I think the world of TB is flat, they say, and all over the world, everyone tells you that. Yes, TB is controlled, we have no problem in TB, but the next sentence they say is that there is a huge problem in dr rising drug resistance. And it's this decades of neglect, I think, that have been partly fostered by the misconception that yes, drugs had beaten the bug that led to this sense of complacency. And the specter of drug-resistant TB really has loomed overhead. This is MDR-TB. Just look, we're just diagnosing 3% of MDR today. What about XDR tuberculosis? In KwaZulu-Natal some years back, this was 50, 52 or 53 patients of HIV actually died, and there was this epidemic that was published that created real flurry in the, in the TB world. And then TDR and TB, again, the very con controversial name, but believe me, it exists. So drug-resistant TB continues to increase, friends, at a remorseless pace. And I really believe it's an epidemic of injustice and an epidemic of neglect. So we have to focus on picking up drug resistance fast. And to me, rapid susceptibility test is necessary. How you do it, you just have to find a way. So whether it's liquid culture DST or it's molecular tests, we actually looked at rapid susceptibility testing directly from midget. And we found that we could report in seven days, in 11 days rather, 85% of results if we actually added the drug directly to the sputum samples. But again, culture has huge problems in terms of long turnaround time. Culture is negative for patients on treatment. This is invariably the problem. The clinicians would remember us when they run into a problem Four months down the line, the patient doesn't seem to be doing well, and then they say, now you grow something and give us answers. This, the issues of infrastructure and contamination, and, and having done susceptibility testing for 20 years, let me tell you, it's really difficult. Standardization of critical concentrations, inoculum size, and stability of drugs in different media is big, big time. So the current paradigm relies on symptomatic patients actually reporting to healthcare when almost six months later, after they have infected their surroundings and other people for three months. So undiagnosed TB really continues to fuel the epidemic. And if you look at this, a smear is positive five months sometimes after the patient has, has been coughing. So the use of molecular rapid assays for rapid detection of drug resistance today has come to stay. And this is technology is known as leapfrogging technology. Why leapfrogging? Because we actually leapfrog over culture. It, has a, it can be directly done on smears, on, on clinical specimens. It has really, really a short turnaround time. It has a sensitivity that approaches that of culture. It's less biohazardous, and it has a feasibility of automation. We did some work where we in, and published this on XDRTB when we looked at the mutations described. And if you look at CAT, G, INH, friends, the time has come. You can no longer ignore these words. You have to speak this language. You have to know what is INHA, you have to know what is CAD-G, especially in the laboratory, because clinicians are going to beg you for this. Where is the RPO beta mutation? Where is the gyrase A mutation? And we found that if it was XDRTB, most of our patients were already CAD-G muta mutated. That means CAD-G is high level resistance, so that window of opportunity of using high dose isoniazid goes when you're CAD-G. If you're INHA, you can do that. Similarly, RPO beta at the 531 site is high level drug resistance and so on and so forth. I'm not going to bore you with these details. In 2008, the WHO endorsed line probe assays, or the HANE test. The HANE test in smear positive has a great sensitivity of 98%, and 60% in smear negative, actually we found it to be less. 
What does this test do? Essentially, it's a PCR where you actually would amplify these targets and then look for hybridize or hybridize your amplified DNA on these membranes and this is how it would look. Just spend a minute and look at this slide because I promise you, your clinicians when you use LPA are going to ask you every incivency detail. The wild type probes are from probe, uh, wild type 1 to 8 and they're four mutant probes. Why do they just have four mutant probes? Because these are the canonized mutations. These are mutations that are just there. If you have these mutations, there's no grumbling about it, there's no discrepancy about it. And these are the mutations, 516, 2, 526, 526 and 1521. So detection of mutation by absence of a wild type signal and presence of a mutant signal actually dictates that this patient has drug resistant TB. Now this slide actually would show you that there are a lot of disputed mutations, 511, 512, blah, blah, blah. These dis disputed mutations, we're going to, as we begin to use more of molecular tests, we're going to see these mutations crop up in our practice where we're going to report absence of wild type and absence of mutant and we're going to say it's resistant and the clinician will tell you, oh, but you know, you said resistant but my patient is doing good. So you have to then go back and say, look, I will actually do his susceptibility and I will show you what is the level of resistance. Invariably, we have found that 511, 512 are low level resistance that really don't need much, but they're there. And this is the LPA sensitivity. This is a great meta-analysis that was done which actually showed that it has a 98% sensitivity and 99 specificity for RIF and 84% sensitivity and 99% specificity for isoniazid. What about the second line? Up until now, the WHO still hasn't actually approved the second line testing. In Mumbai, since clearly we are a hotspot for drug-resistant tuberculosis, we found that it works well. And I would urge you, if you have a first line going, at least for your private practice, bring in the second line, because it's a really useful test. And we've just published in CID where we found that patients who have fluoroquinolone resistant upfront are far more likely to do worse on the DOTS plus regime than those who don't have fluoroquinone resistance. And you'd only know that if you can pick this up. So the sensitivity and specificity in our hands has been 91% for the fluoroquinolones, 98% and almost 100% for the second line injectables. It doesn't do too well, unfortunately, with, for ethambutol. Ethambutol is little unreliable for the second line, so don't just swear blindly by it. Let's take this case. This was a 35-year-old taxi driver. He was on first line drug, not doing, treat, doing well at all. As you can see, there is a nice infiltrate there. As is usual with TB treatment, he got fed up and became irregular and his chest x-ray worsens. He was HIV negative and non-diabetic and his smear continued to be positive. With this background of poor compliance and clinical deterioration, we were asked to sort of make a judgment call of what we should give this patient. And wild cultures were sent. We actually quickly did a, quickly did a LPA first line and second line and could tell the clinician that yes, he is MDR, but he is susceptible to the fluoroquinolones and the aminoglycosides, and he was appropriately treated in two days, and no longer could he infect all his passengers in an AC taxi. So four weeks later, this was the susceptibility that was completely borne out on, on DST. But the problems with LPA are that it does not necessarily eliminate the need for culture in DST. You still have to do cultures for smear negatives, you still have to do a drug susceptibility testing for ethambutol, pyrazinamide, ethionamide, pass, etc. And what do you do when MTB is not detected? And what do you do when you get an absence of a wild type of mutant? Is it really resistant? And what do you do when you get mixed infections?